Hello, welcome to today's webinar on Rudbeckia. My name is Deborah and I'm a volunteer at the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. If you're not a member of MSHS, now is a good time to join. Members receive not only our award-winning magazine, but also discounts at nurseries and greenhouses, free tickets to our local home show, free webinars, and more. Your membership dollars also allow us to bring great programming like this to all of you. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You are attending the webinar in listen-only mode, so you'll be able to hear our presenter, but we cannot hear you. That way there won't be background noise. You will receive an email with a link to a copy of the recording of this webinar within 24 to 48 hours of us finishing here tonight. If you have questions for our presenter, you can type those in on the panel on the right side of your screen. We'll be covering questions as we go, so send them in as you think of them, and we'll cover any extra at the end. If you do not see the panel, look for an orange arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Click on that arrow and it'll pop out the panel. And now please welcome today's speaker, Mary Frances McGuire Lerman. Mary learned how to garden from her grandmothers, Frances Ann Morgan Regan, Reagan, excuse me, and Teresa Lillian Van Kinder McGuire. Her mother was too busy raising eight children. She was the oldest daughter and the gardener and lawnmower at her family home. When she entered college, she discovered horticultural, horticultural science at the University of Minnesota. Mary graduated in 1974 with a degree in horticultural science and immediately began working at Coma Conservatory. In fact, she was the one who suggested the installation of a bromeliad display in the dome garden, which was first planted in 1975. In 1976, she was hired away by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, where she worked for 32 years as the horticulturalist, designing, directing, and expanding garden operations, creating the naturalist program at the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden, initiating the invasive species removal programs and working for five years with state agencies to get buckthorn declared a restricted noxious weed in Minnesota to prevent any further propagation or sale. During our stay at home time, she has been preparing and presenting numerous webinars for MSHS on a variety of genera of flowering plants. Take it away, Mary. Well, good evening. How is my volume? Is it working okay? Deborah? Sorry, I muted myself. Okay. Um, it sounds great. <laughs> okay. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about Rudbeckia. We'll tell you where the name comes from. We'll talk about uh, special facts regarding Rudbeckia and their uh, physical or growing needs. Uh, we'll look at both annual and perennial Rudbeckias. Um, the Rudbeckias are all in the aster family. and there are two types of flowers on the Rudbeckia. What you might call petals on, on the blooms like you see in this photo are actually what are known as ray flowers. And then in the actual cone itself are individual numerous, excuse me, numerous individual disc flowers. Um, and those will change color as they start to open and produce pollen. So the disc flowers is where the pollinators are attracted. So we're looking here at uh, Rudbeckia Goldsturm, which has been um, in the trade since 1937. Um, and I think that image towards the back that's showing um, plants with combinations of yellow and orange flowers is just a work of the afternoon sunlight here. I just took them a couple hours ago right after the rain and there was intense sunlight because they are all generally appearing like the ones in the front of the image here. Okay, so some of the Rudbeckia facts. Where does the name come from? Um, the genus Rudbeckia was named after Olaf Rudbeck the Elder and Olaf Rubeck the Younger by Swedish botanist Carolus Linnaeus. Um, both of the Rudbecks were professors of, of medicine at Uppsala University. 
and had a great interest in botany and they were friends of Linnaeus. So that's where the name comes from. Now, some of the things to know about Rudbeckia, there are medicinal uses of this, um, not widely known. Uh, so let me read to you. Native American tribes first used the black-eyed Susan medicinally. The Ojibwa, who the French originally called the Chippewa because they didn't understand that they were saying Ojibwa, um, and they have now renamed themselves the Anishinaabe tribe and are primarily in northern Minnesota now, treated snake bites by making the plant into an external wash. Additionally, they turned it into an infusion that could be used to treat both colds and worms. Uh, the Menominee and the Potawatomi, no, wait a minute. Potawatomi tribes utilized the roots and diuretic properties in the form of a tea. And also the root juices were used to treat earaches. Uh, the two main active ingredients in the Black Eyed Susan are sesquiterpene, lactones and pulchulin. Sesquiterpene lactones have been studied to be responsible for certain antimicrobial activity. Pulchulin is a particular type of sesquiterpene lactone that is isolated from black-eyed Susan plants in particular. This compound has been shown to be an active member in anti-worm activity, anti-inflammatory responses, and antibacterial properties. And this lactone is taken directly from the root of the plant and certain labs have tried to replicate the structure formation and cultures. However, the amounts they've been able to produce have been relatively low in comparison to what they can get from naturally occurring structures in the plants. Then we need to know that it's a great cut flower, both fresh and dried, and it also provides great winter interest in the garden. So don't cut it down in the fall. Let the snow drift in around the plants as you see in the photo. And the birds will still come to harvest the seeds through the winter months. I also used to cut them along with a lot of other drying flower forms from my garden, as still bees, um, semifugas and others, and put it in my uh, planter box in front of my home. And the planter box was south facing. So if you put evergreens in there by February, they were frozen in and they turned brown. Um, using dried stems, they stayed there all season, looked great, and there were, was lots of bird activity there too. Now, the thing to keep in mind when you're cutting fresh flowers is it should be done one of two times during the day. You should either cut them in the very early morning or late in the evening. And immediately after cutting them, you need to put them into a warm water bath, pretty much like baby bottle warm, um, for them to quickly take up the water, put the bucket in a cool area overnight. And then, you know, after, after that evening, you can design with the flowers because they will be fully turgid. Some of the requirements for Rudbeckia. Well, if you think about where you see them growing naturally in prairies, they need full sun, they need extremely good air circulation. Um, if you do not have good air circulation, if you have other plants crowded around them or they're not getting any wind flow in there, then you will start getting leaf spot diseases. Um, this was particularly a problem in 2019 because of the excessive rainfall levels that we had here in Minnesota. Um, and uh, I think last year ended up being rated as the top year as far as the amount of, of uh, precipitation recorded in the state. They also do well in well-drained soils, but they're also known, uh, the perennial ones at least, as clay busters. Um, so unless you have the clay that you could immediately mold and put into a kiln and make croquet balls out of, um, you can, can often use these in clay soils. So let's look at the annual Rudbeckias, which are generally called the Gloriosa daisies, um, but still you'll see people referring to them as black-eyed Susans. There are numerous cultivars out there, and within those numerous colors and combinations, you have singles, you have semi-doubles and double flowers, and they're easily grown from seed. Um, 
they, you know, they don't like to be transplanted once they've got large, gotten larger. So I would suggest starting them in, in seed trays or packs and then planting them out directly where you want them to be in your garden. Um, I want to interrupt here and talk about using a product such as Soil Moist, which is a copolymer. It's a crystal that will expand and hold like 200 times its weight in water. I use it every time I plant anything. Um, it ensures you a complete survival and very good establishment. Even this year, when we had those horrendous warm winds in June that were just sucking the moisture out of the plants. Um, and it was hard for those plants to keep bringing the water up from the soil. Well, what Soil Moist and uh, Terrasorb is another brand do is that these crystals, when you put them in the planting hole and you add water, the crystals after a couple waterings will expand to hold 200 times their weight in water. And so there will be an immediate source of water for the roots and it also helps them get well established. So let's look at some of these annual Gloriosa daisies that are out there on the market. And you'll see, for example, with green eyes, excuse me, green eyes and prairie sun, that you see what are called halos around the disc flowers. Um, so in prairie sun, you have kind of an orange halo um, coming out on the ray flowers and the tips of them are yellow. And in the case of green eyes, um, appropriately named because the disc flowers are an intense green when they first open, or, develop and then you have that orange halo and again the yellow petals coming out. There are also these darker or rustic colors that you'll see um, such as Sahara and Cherokee Sunset. Um, last year we grew Denver Daisy in the MSHS garden at the State Fair um, and most people coming up to them thought they were, were dwarf sunflowers because if you look at them you'll just see the immense size of them. Then um, more Gloriosa daisies that are out there. Um, and I'm showing you, I think about 18 different cultivars, but there's probably more than that. So you have cappuccino, um, chim chimney is an interesting one. It's the only one I know of that has quilled um, ray petals, ray, ray flowers or petals. Um, then you get into some of the darker um, maroon colors, cherry brandy, um, and with the autumn colors, you get um, the intense uh, ray size flowers with, with the kind of golden orange uh, petals at the tips. You have combinations like ruby gold. It's a mixture that, ruby, that uh, Park Seed puts together. And then um, finally, um, Moreno, I would love to get my hands on. It's, it's hard to find the seed of that, but what a beauty. And look at how uh, large the diameter is of the ray flower in the center. And notice in that, that you're seeing all the gold um, in, the, in the ray flower ring. And that is pollen that's developing. So it's the ray part of the flower that's going to attract your pollinators in. Toto, incidentally, um, looks quite big, but it's actually um, has big flowers, but it's a, a much shorter um, variety as would be suggested by its name. Any questions out there on the annual um, yes. brood vecchias? We do. Um, Amy would like to know, how do the native pollinators interact with them? Well, I can't, you know, I can't be sure. I'm simply going to make a guess here where I still see pollinators on these. Um, and I, you know, I, unless you sit down and, and trial every one of these in a garden to know whether they all have rich pollen levels by simply having somebody sit there all day and monitor the number of insects coming in, um, that's the best way to find out. Okay, um, and are we are you going to be covering um, diseases and insects at some point? Yes, we will cover okay, that great. as we come then along. That, 
then this can wait for that. Yes, I should comment on the gloriosas though, is if you do not have good airflow around them, you know, they are prone, um, just like the perennial ones, with the exception of one or two varieties of, of bringing in, in leaf diseases. And so last year, it wasn't just a problem with, um, with rudbeckias. Um, so many of our, our plants last year had diseases. If any of you grew penstemon, there was a major penstemon rust outbreak. When you have that kind of situation where you have consistent rainfalls and no time to dry the foliage off, this is when the diseases develop easily because the spores are carried by the air. They land on the leaf. If the leaf is moist, it's really easy for the diseases then to root into the leaf layers. And if we think about how thin a leaf is, there's actually a number of different cell layers in there. Um, one of them is the palisades, um, which are kind of in the middle between the two edges of the leaf. Um, but it's, it's amazing how fast these diseases can move down in. Um, I remember a year like this in the 90s where we, it rained every day um, up until August 1st. And we had put in these gardens all over uh, Minneapolis parks and the signs. And in August, it suddenly dried up and got very warm. And the plant, we couldn't keep up with the water trucks. I just finally said to them, give up. You know, the gardens are just gonna die because what happens in wet seasons like that is that the roots need to stay where they can get some oxygen. So they don't go down deep. So that when we went and looked at those plants and pulled them out, they were still in their narrow cubes of soil that they'd been planted in in May. Um, and because the soil was so saturated, they didn't put their roots out. So then once it warmed up and dried, these, these guys were gone. So let's look at perennial rudbeckia. There are six species we're gonna look at today. And then there are also some hybrids and they're kind of mixed in here. So the one that most people are familiar with, the black-eyed Susan, um, Gold Sturm is the one that was introduced in 1937 out of Germany. Um, and Gold Sturm means gold storm, which I think is very appropriate for the images when you see these masses in bloom. Um, it's been around forever, but in the last 20 years, we've now started seeing um, a septorial leaf spot disease showing up on these plants. Um, the plants will look excellent. They'll get up to bloom size. And then suddenly the leaves will just start turning black. They're just covered with leaf spot. The whole leaves die and then the plant dies down too. Um, often the plant may recover the next spring and come back, um, but it is severely weakened. So you will find people that haven't had an issue with septorial leaf spot. And I've seen some beds where I've planted this over the years and they're looking fine. But then when I go in closely, I'll look and see maybe one or two plants are showing it. Um, there is a theory that um, the disease is spread on infected seed also. So that, you know, starting your own seed is not necessarily the way to go. Um, so Goldsturm is still there, but there, we're gonna show you a really nice replacement for it that's come out on the market. Um, now, Walter's Gardens has introduced a dwarf, um, it's not, excuse me, Walter's Gardens is promoting it, but Giletto out of Europe is the um, seed producer of Little Gold Star because Goldsturm will get up, um, probably breast height, sometimes higher, depending on the heat and the moisture levels of the growing season. While this one is more of a knee-high tall plant um, and it's much more um, proportional. And it forms a bushy clump, rich green foliage, just like you'd have on gold sturm. Um, but literally, if you see the note here, 80 flowers have been counted on a single plant. Um, and so far, this is not showing any issues uh, with septoria leaf spot. 
Now, here's the one that's come out. And I think this is the first year where we're seeing a lot of this on the market. Um, I've seen it in numerous garden centers called American Gold Rush. So it's it has another species involved, DMI. Um, and so the leaves are completely different than what you'd have on uh, gold sturm or little gold star. You don't have the glossy, wide, thick green leaves. Instead, you have these thin, hairy leaves. Um, and because of that, the water will shed off a lot faster. Um, and so there's less chance of disease and they have not seen any sign of Cyptoria on this plant. Um, it has this dome-like habit, golden yellow flowers produced heavily from July to September. And these are notes from Walters Gardens in Michigan. Um, incidentally, Walters Gardens is, is the um, propagator and um, plug grower for all of the uh, new specialty annuals that you see out there um, on the market. And why I can't think of the brand name, maybe some of you will. Uh, they have matching pots. It's not coming to me at this moment, but I'm hoping someone out there will know it's the big brand with, you know, hundreds of, of perennials. So that's Mary, would that be proven winners? Proven winners, yes. They do all the proven winners. And I did talk to their staff. Um, Jane, who lives in Minneapolis, is one of their um, biggest salespeople here and consultants. And I said to her, Jane, I said, they told me at the convention center that they're growing um, free of neonicotinoids. And she said, yes, they are. But the thing to keep in mind is they're growing plugs and they send the plugs out to local growers to pot them up into three inch or larger pots um, that then go to the retailers for sale. So once, when it leaves Walter's Gardens, it's been grown neonic free, but they can't guarantee what happens at the growers, you know, that are, are uh, potting it up and growing them on. Any other questions right now? Um, yeah, we do have one question about the soil moist, the moisture pellet, pellets right. that right. you talked about. Um, and Kelly brings up a point that I don't remember if I've heard this one before, but she said, I had understood that the moisture pellets would crowd roots when they expand and we shouldn't use it. Also that because it expanded, the roots could not get the moisture from the material. Any thoughts on this? I'd love to water less if I can. Yeah, I have never seen that happen. I have used this product since 1985 in the parks and elsewhere. Um, I have seen plugs, um, small plugs, big plugs that we've put in um, grow to full size blooming perennials by the end of the first season. Um, and they are still well rooted and established. Um, these, these polymers persist for up to five years in the soil around roots for perennials. Um, it's usually shorter in the annuals because people pull the annuals out and they often just you know, toss everything. And if you're using soil moist on your annual roots, it's important you gently pull them up and then shake that soil moist back into the soil um, so it can be there for future years. So I, I just love this product. It's, you know, it's $15 a pound when you buy it in the hardware store. If you buy it online, you can buy a three pound jar for about $28 and everybody seems to be doing free shipping nowadays. Um, I think over this summer at some of the various garden spots where I volunteer, I've used up to three pounds. Um, but we've been planting a lot of, of new plants um, going in. And it's frustrating after you've done a mass planting to see so many people, so many plants, you know, not thriving. Um, when we did a planting um, two years ago, where we put a couple thousand plants in on one site, I can count on one hand the number of plants that we lost. Um, and, and at least half of those were because we had some little varmint to pull them out um, 
otherwise, you know, when, when you talk about plugs <clears throat> that the root system is only about two inches deep and they have a few leaves on them to take off and get that well established, you will not see that happen unless you have some type of a, um, an additive there in the soil to keep those roots constantly moist because if they go through any drying period while they're trying to get established, then you're gonna have stunting on them. So I hope that answers it. Any other questions? Okay, yes. Um, Amy asks, do you use soil moist on all types of new plants? For example, even if they like dry sites? Okay, so that's a good point. Um, I do not use them around bulbous plants. Um, I would not use them around succulents. Um, I would not use it with bearded iris um, because of the, the rhizome and bearded iris can get iris bores so fast when we have a moist season and they prefer a much drier, well-drained soil. So those are the ones um, that so far I have not used them around. Okay, that's it for now. Okay. So one of my favorites um, is a native Rudbeckia that grows in moist sites. So if you're um, making a rain garden, designing it, and you need something very tall for the back of the rain garden, um, this is the best. Um, and I'd recommend the, the cultivar Herbstone came out of Germany. You know, all these plant explorers came to the US or the colonies. Um, and started collecting plants and took them back to Europe. And then they started doing lots of interesting breeding with them. So Herbstone has stronger stems. Um, what's nice about this particular Rudbeckia um, is that it has pendulous ray flowers. And sometimes when people see the pendulous ray flowers, they think you're a bad gardener and have not been watering and the plants are drooping. That's not the case here. These are naturally appearing like this, just like we have the native pale purple, pale purple cone flower that grows in our prairies also has the pendulous ray flowers. Now, in the right photo, you'll see how they look kind of a primrose yellow. This is the way they look when they're coming out. In the center photo, you'll notice all the pollen on the ray flowers. So these flowers are pretty mature and they're getting a little bit more of a golden yellow color to them. And something went wrong with this image on the left because they never turn orange. Um, but I wanted that photo in to show you what the ray flowers, how they develop. If you look at that cone in the center, there's hundreds and maybe a thousand of, of ray, excuse me, disc florets circling that cone. And they open from the bottom up. And you'll notice the gold on the tips there. This is again the pollen that will attract in your uh, pollinators for this. You'll have both bees and butterflies coming in to harvest um, the nectar and the pollen from this plant. So found in moist prairies and along streams, it depends on the year and also how long it's been established. But first year you should count on probably three to four feet um, I've had them get up to that nine foot height, especially when we've got very wet seasons. Um, and with herb stone, um, that selection, uh, I've never had to stake it. On um, some of the others, uh, the native ones, sometimes the flowers, uh, the flower stems are not quite as strong. So that's really the, the only difference um, between the native and herb stone is the stem strength. Now in the center photo, you'll see it's credited to minnesotawildflowers.info. Um, Peter Zook was formerly with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And when he retired, he took to his hobby, um, photographing and starting this website, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, not just photos, but lots of detailed information for you about where you'd find these plants um, and, and their preferred um, habitat site. So if you're, if you're looking at Minnesota wildflowers and say, hey, 
I want to I want to pick some to put in my rain garden. Then go on to the site and look. They're also sorted by flower color. So if you're trying to ID a plant, it's a great great website to use. Now, so this is called the green-headed coneflower, Rudbeckia laciniata, because if you look at the leaves, which you see in the center photo, they're highly lobed, or, or you might want to think of as being lashed. There is another one, though, the double um, green-headed coneflower called Golden Glow. And there you won't see the green um, cone head to it. Um, double flowers. They always require staking or they will flop over or an early, very early season, prune them back, you know, when they've gone about 18 inches tall, cut them back to nine inches um, to contain their height because they will branch more and have more support. And long ago, it was known as the outhouse plant as it would lean against the structure for support. And of course, because there was usually a little more moisture around the outhouses. I'm sure there's no questions about that. Actually. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, not about that in particular, not, not about the outhouse, um, but about, I'm going to slaughter the, the uh, Latin, I'm sorry, La Liciniata? Yep. Liciniata, okay. okay. Um, Amy wants to know, do the native ones need more sun to not need staking? Um. You were talking Probably. about the herb stone being stronger. Right. Yes, right. Probably they do. Um, and what you'll see is they're often growing up actually amongst um, and often under nearby shrubs. And so that's why they're often bending out um, and often falling or curving or putting putting Ys in their stems as they go up. Um, so the more sunlight they get, the better they are as far as stem strength. Awesome. Okay, we'll pass the outhouse plant. Um, this I think is one of the most dramatic rudbeckias that you can grow in your garden. And it's hard to find locally. Um, so you may have to just go online and check or check and call your local garden center first next spring and say, or not next spring, say to them this fall because they're gonna be placing their orders for next spring, late fall. Um, Rudbeckia maxima has this intense bluish gray leaf that's kind of concave the way it's growing upright along the stems. Um, it can get to be very tall, so it's a great accent plant for the back of the border. But you need to provide very good air circulation around it, and you want people to be able to see the foliage. So if you're using it, plant it at the end of a garden um, where people are walking up and they'll see the edge of it so they can see the foliage. Um, I think um, if you have a really, really huge container and you want something really to pop it, this might be a great plant for you to look at. Um, it was found in the Oklahoma Territory. It is hardy here. And not only are the um, leaves this bluish, intense bluish color, kind of steel blue, they have a very waxy texture to them. Um, and it was named um, by, an, again, another English botanist. There were all kinds of English botanists in this country in the late 16 and 1700s because this was an opportunity to go out and explore, find new plants. You know, many of them had, um, arrangements with gardeners back in England that they would, you know, sell them a portion of the seeds or the plants when they came back. So it was a lucrative job um, for them to be uh, coming to the colonies um, and later the U.S. to find many of these plants. And just as we have problems with plants that came from Europe and have become invasive, they found the same thing. One of the plants that they took back to England that has become a nightmare over there is Canada goldenrod. Now, Canada goldenrod, if it gets loose in your gardens here, is a nightmare. If it's in the prairie where it's sur surrounded by grasses that keep it in check because it spreads, it spreads by rhizomes very quickly in loose garden soils. Um, so they're dealing 
with that plant over there in England at this point. In fact, I remember going in to see this one Irish garden that they were planting about 12 years ago, and they were planting in Canada goldenrod. And I went up to the gardener and I said, I don't know if you realize this, but this is a major, going to be a major pest issue for you in your garden. And I was kind of ignored. So <laughs> you, you try to share information, but sometimes it's just not welcome. So this is one I would highly recommend. And also look at the, the individual flower photo. The ray petals are kind of twisted. They're notched at the ends. And then the, the cone or the ray flower structure is extremely um, tall and narrow compared to any of the other Rudbeckias you've seen so far. Now, we have a couple out there that are on the market that are claimed to be annual or claimed to be perennials, but I think sometimes we need to look at as treating them as, um, as annuals. Um, Park Seed has a selection out there called Green Wizard. Another one that's on the market um, is Black Beauty. Now, the difference in the photos here, the Green Wizard, you're seeing it just as the flower, um, the flower, in a sense, has unfurled. These are rayless flowers, so you're not seeing, those are not petals, those are calyx, um, the green, green looking petals there. And then um, because the ray flowers have not opened, it's just this intense brownish black color. On the other hand, on the black beauty, you're seeing about a quarter of the ray flower have opened a quarter to about half of them, depending on the bloom. And so you see that gold um, pollen that's appearing as the flowers open as they go up the stem. So I would suggest you give these a try, but I would not buy them as plants. I would buy them as seed and probably start them uh, late March, early April in some uh, four packs or six packs, um, and then get them planted. These, I, from my experience, um, need really, really good circulation. Um, and so it's, it's another um, unique type of bloom to add to the uh, texture in your garden. Now, I just went out and got the photo of Henry Eilers a couple hours ago after the rain stopped here. I first saw Henry in a garden center last fall on clearance. And growing up in a big family, you always bought things on clearance. Then I wanted to try it because the flowers are very unique. Um, they are quilled. So we saw earlier a quilled um, ray flower um, on one of the annual Rudbeckias. This is the one that will give it to you in a perennial form. Now, I'm looking down on this plant. It's actually at about a three foot height right now, and they can get up to five feet, but that probably won't happen until next year because it takes a couple of years for these perennials to get their root system down to get at their maximum height. Um, again, has a, um, a fairly wide leaf, um, but it's not that super shiny. It's kind of coarse. Um, did not notice any diseases on it last year when I planted it, um, but it likes it in these drier soils. So I have it, um, I planted it to hide a, a transformer outside our apartment building that stands like six feet tall, this giant metal green monster. Um, and I think by next year, it will pretty much have accomplished that fact. So Henry Eilers, um, they describe it as looking like asterisks, asterisks on the, on the plants. Um, Henry was a horticulturist who found this growing in a remnant railroad prairie in Illinois. Now on the right side, you're gonna see the species, the regular species, um, kind of similar leaves, not as cupped as you see on, on Henry Eilers. Um, in Minnesota, this has only been found once in Mauer County down near the Iowa border. Um, so it's that we're at its northern tip of range at the Iowa-Minnesota border. Nevertheless, 
it's hardy here. And you will find um, many of these natives, native Rebecca's, sold either through landscape alternatives, which are located at a beautiful farm nursery up along the St. Croix River, or um, through glacial ridge growers. Um, and glacial ridge is out in Glenwood, Minnesota, but they sell to a lot of um, Minnesota community garden centers. Um, so that would be your source for those particular plants. And our final Rudbeckia to look at um, is the brown-eyed Susan, which definitely has more of a brownish center in the, in the left image that you see there. This is the native uh, species, a photo that Peter Zook took. Um, will do very well in gardens, blooms a little later in the summer, um, but gets quite tall, three to four feet with massive numbers of blooms. So it's great as a cut flower too. Um, there has been um, a selection that Giletto out in Europe has produced. Um, this was a photo provided by uh, Giletto through North Creek Perennials. Uh, Rudbeckia triloba prairie glow. Um, instead of the ye yellowish gold um, ray petals here, you actually have, similar to what you see on Gloriosa daisies, you have a halo um, and then the outer portion of the ray uh, flowers or petals are the golden yellow. Um, it looks very interesting. It is multi-branching. Um, part of the problem with the species as you see in the left, it's kind of held up by a fence. So the more branching that you can get, the more stable and stiffer your stems are going to be. And it's, um, again, blooming July through into October. And it's a very valuable pollinator plant. Any of these that have viable pollen on them, um, any of these Rebeccas are going to be of benefit um, to your pollinators. And in, in the case of Rudbeckias, these are going to be bees and butterflies. So, oh, I'll stay on the photo here. Um, we've taken our trip through Rudbeckia. Um, I'll be ready to answer some more questions here in a minute, but I just want to tell you a story. A couple years ago, my husband and daughter and I went on a trip to Budapest. And we, had, we went on a walking tour around the city. And if you go traveling, this is one of the best way to learn about cities, provided you can be out there walking for three to four hours. And they advertise it as a free, water, a free walking tour. But at the very end, they say, we want to ask you if you felt that you learned a lot and you enjoyed your tour guide to please make a donation. And so I'm asking the same of you tonight, if you felt you learned something from this webinar, um, please feel free to make a donation to the Minnesota State Hort Society. And with that, I'm ready for more questions. Um, Mary has been waiting very patiently since the very beginning of this. Oh, okay. how can I prevent aphids from enjoying my Rudbeckia as much as I do? Well, um, aphids reproduce asexually, um, and I don't think anyone has been able to figure out how to stop that. Um, the one, the one benefit you could have is distributing ladybug beetles that would thrive on these. The trick with these is when you buy them, um, and many of the specialty garden centers will will sell them. Um, is people just open them up and release them. And you can't do that. You need to wait into the evening hours when it's cooler because insects are cold-blooded insects. And so they don't fly off when it's cooled down. And so then you go around and you will distribute them among your plants. And they will sit there for the evening, may be aware of their prey, and often stay there for a long time. On the other hand, if you distribute them in the middle of the day when it's warm, 98% of them are just going to fly off. So that's one way to deal with them. Um, really don't want to encourage um, 
insecticides, but if you feel that you must, uh, probably the best one to work with is actually a bio control agent called azadiractin. It comes from the neem tree in India, um, and it can be applied to both food and ornamental crops, and basically just puts a horrible taste on the foliage of the plant. Uh, um, and also um, on the insects so that you don't have heavy, if you have beetles coming in, you don't have heavy defoliation of the plant that way. Um, but I think ideally, you know, your uh, um, ladybug beetles might be the way to go. And that brought up another question that I remembered earlier, the diseases that we're dealing with Rudbeckia are the septoria leaf spot, which turns the plant uh, foliage totally black. Um, and this new American gold rush is a selection that will not have that problem. But then when we have these horrendously wet seasons, there's not much you can do when powdery mildew strikes. Um, unless you wanna look crazy to your neighbors, and I've frequently done this. Um, if you take a, a giant fan outside um, and just blow it through your gardens um, when we're having a wet season, of course, not when it's raining, um, to quickly dry the foliage of the plants off, this would be a way to um, reduce the amount of of powdery mildew that you're seeing in there. But these are rare years when, when that happens. Um, or, in, or they can be situations where the plants are too dense, they haven't been divided in a while, or there's other perennials growing around them. Or maybe you have a shrub that's cutting off um, a natural wind flow into the area. So that what you can do is look at thinning that shrub out or taking it out if you don't want it there so that you get that airflow in. Um, and if you're looking at this photo on the brown-eyed Susan, I think one of the biggest disease issues as far as powdery mildew goes is all these people putting up these solid, dense wood fences that have no airflow through them. When you think of Robert Frost talking about fences, you know, and what they do to people. Well, this is the same thing that happens with plants. If you, if you can't get normal air circulation in and about, you're gonna have problems in your gardens. So you'll notice with many fence companies, you have options where you have definite slot openings between the boards so that you can get air moving through that. Um, so keep this in mind when you're thinking about putting a fence up and how it's going to cut off the airflow into your garden. That's a really good point. I know I didn't consider that when I had my fencing put in. Um, we do have a question about, uh, so taking a fan out there, how gentle does it need to be? Is that something you could use a leaf blower oh, to dry God, out the plant? I hate leaf blowers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whoever I will admit, I use mine out. because it also shreds them, so and it sucks them yes. up. No, um, leaf leaf blower but, is way way too strong. You is know, that too strong? Is, okay. Yeah, I would just I took out a big box fan, and with a long extension cord, and just moved it around the yard um, as much as I could. You know, putting it half an hour at least on a site at a time, especially choosing the ones that that you know seem to be showing more problems right away. Um, also with powdery mildew, it often starts on the lower leaves of the plant. So when you see it, if you can quickly get in and remove those leaves and dispose of them, not in a compost pile um, and get them out of there because when they drop to the ground, then you're gonna have, the next time it rains, it's just gonna hit those and pop them up into the next layer of leaves. Hey, our next question was, could you say a little bit about aster yellows? Oh, yes. Well, aster yellows are out there. Now, I haven't seen them much on the brown-eyed Susans or the black-eyed Susans or much of the rudbeckias. I have seen this a lot on the coneflowers 
which is a different genus, the Echinacea. Um, Aster yellows is a, I'm trying to remember, a micro, it's not micro, but it's a special type of virus that's spread by leafhopper insects. So when it shows up here, it's when we have consistent storms that are coming up from the Gulf Coast. And on those winds, they will carry these fine little leaf hoppers that will feed on a plant. And within days, you'll start getting symptoms. As far as it depends on the plant, though, um, you'll see this on marigolds while they start turning black. You'll have carrots that when you pull them out, they're totally deformed and they're very bitter. Um, they will kill off chrysanthemums. Um, but on coneflowers, what they do is is they distort the flower. And frankly, I have some images that I took and I, I really find these funky flowers to be kind of interesting. I know they're diseased, but um, even in their last year of life, <laughs> I think they're, they're amazing because you'll have some without ray flowers, some with double ray flowers, some with ray flowers coming out of the disc flowers. Um, I don't often see the um, heavy yellowing or greenish yellowing or chartreuse coloring in the foliage. Occasionally I do. Um, really all you can do is dig them out and dispose of them. Um, and it's often recommended that you not replant um, the next year um, with coneflowers in that same area. Um, that being said, I planted a whole lot of coneflowers after over the last two to three years. And we have been very blessed to uh, really have not had our major storms coming from the south, but from the west or the southwest. These leaf hoppers are the reason why you cannot grow head lettuce in Minnesota. Anybody that tries to grow head lettuce except for that first seeding that you put in in mid-April, if you try later, um, the leaf hoppers will get them and within a day or two of feeding on them, you have this ugly pile of mush out there. And the leaf hoppers cannot get over the Rocky Mountains, which is why all of our head lettuce in the US is grown in California and the Western states. So that's what I can tell you about um, the aster yellows. Um, and generally um, you just, if you keep an eye on the weather and you hear where the storms are coming from, it's particularly when we have um, hurricanes and such that are coming into the Gulf Coast and then pushing all this moisture north, um, this is when we often get uh, the leaf hoppers coming in. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary would like to know, can you talk about saving seeds from these plants? Why not? Um, in general, I would save seeds, except for if you're seeing anyone with the, or any of the plants with us with this septoria leaf spot where it's big um, blobs of black on the foliage and they coalesce and they eventually take over the entire leaf, turning it black. Do not collect seed from these. Um, but if you're uh, if you're if you're not using a lot of it, just take what you need and then leave the rest of these up for the winter months because the birds will come in um, all through the winter to harvest the seed from these disc flowers. When you harvest the seed, you need to, even though it may appear dry, set it out on some trays lined with paper towel, um, let them dry down for a good week, and then you can um, stored in individual envelopes, but those envelopes then should be put in a container, um, preferably like a glass container with a screw on lid. And then if you take a Kleenex and put a tablespoon or two of powdered milk in it, and then tie it up like a sachet and put that into the, the glass container, um, if there's still any moisture in abundant moisture in those seeds, it will be drawn into the powdered milk so that you won't have any molding on your seeds. And then ideally they want you to store your seeds, 
I think between like 45 and 55 degrees. So if you have a cool basement, um, old concrete floor, when people used to have basements, you know, where you could store your some of your bulbs for the winter, but so many homes have been turned into recreation rooms and they put direct heating down there. Um, so th those are just my thoughts. Okay. Um, on the triloba, um, for the prairie glow, you said that it blooms from July to October. Is that, is the native species the same? Yep. The yeah, same? We'll yep. Okay, great. Um, we also have a couple of people who are hoping that you could spell the insecticide from the neem. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. You know, it's out there under a number of, of brands. Um, Azadiractin. So it's A-Z-A-D-I-R-A-C-H-T-I-N. And it's from the neem tree in India. And it, you know, that tree, the neem tree has been a source of many products. It's used in toothpaste in India um, and many other um, uh, lotions and such. Um, but it's a, it's a great product um, to use. I um, used to recommend it for uh, Japanese beetles. If the minute you see them coming in, if you can spray your foliage with that, um, that it's feeding on, you know, how it likes birch and it loves Virginia creeper and hollyhocks. I mean, those are some of its favorite plants, but I've seen it on speckled alder. Um, and if you get, get it on there, it has this horrible taste and it will repel the, uh, the Japanese beetles. The problem is the plant continues to grow foliage so you will need to go back. Um, granted, the Japanese beetles are usually only around for two to three weeks feeding before they then drop to the ground and, and start uh, laying eggs. Um, that way you will protect the plants there. It generally won't stop them from eating rose blooms. Um, you can try it, um, but my experience is, has not done a whole lot that way. Okay, and just for everyone to know, um, if you look on your control panel where it says chat, I have posted the name and spelling of this item. Oh, okay. So I wrote it down for everybody. Um, so if you just look under chat, I have it hopefully spelled correctly. Yeah, and there's there's a number of companies. I would think Bonide has it. Um, I just haven't looked at products in the last few years, but there's a number of companies that are selling biocontrols, which are which are um, agents to help control insects and diseases that are made from biological items rather than um, a produced chemical compound. Okay, um, our next question is, we grow three herda cultivars from seed every year by winter sowing, Irish eyes, Indian summer, and prairie sun. Okay. All bloom well the first year, and we have about 90% survival in Minneapolis for a second year. Okay. The second year bloom is much more profuse. <laughs> However, we've been finding that the second year plants of prairie sun mostly turn out mutated with no ray petals at all. Any ideas Ooh. what might cause that? No, um, but th this is a good point that she brings up. Many times you will have some Gloriosa daisies survive and come through. Um, and so I, I'm talking about them as annuals, but there are indeed some cases where if we have a winter like we did last year, where it came in gently, that means we got good snow levels before we got really cold temperatures. Then you have that ice, you know, that insulation snow right around the base of the plants. So that, you know, in those years, I mean, I had dianthus that came through and these annual dianthus that normally get three to four inches tall, were eight to 10 inches tall this season um, because they completely made it through the winter. But I can't tell you why they suddenly went 
rayless. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not sure. Unless, uh, you know, I have, not, as I said, I have not seen aster yellows before on Rebecca's unless they had fed on them the year before um, and there had been not any obvious damage, um, then that would be a, a typical reaction. Okay. Um, and we do have one question. Um, they say we have our first crop of native plants uh, which is mostly Rudbeckia, the seeds are from prairie restoration. Okay. And they're wondering what kinds they might be. Now, I know that prairie resto lists what they put in their seed mixes. Right. Um, but she says she's wondering um, if you would have an idea what they would be. And she says, I think we'll be mowing everything down next spring. Hopefully, they'll come back as they're so gorgeous. Right, so is um, I'm curious if this is the first year. So what, these are not plants that you put in, but you've seeded, I'm guessing that you've seeded a prairie. Um, and typically the very first year, you will have a lot of Rudbeckia herta coming into bloom. Um, that's one of the, the beauties of it. The second year, this is this is from about 10 years of experience and working on prairies in the Minneapolis parks. The uh, she says year, it is, this is the first year. First year. So the second year, I tended to see about half as many um, coming back because some of the other plants that did not bloom the first year have gotten better established. So there's more competition coming in there. So you will still have some, um, some of your Rudbeckia blooming. Um, and I, in general, you know, you need, you need to look at the seed label and if you don't have it, you could, you could contact them and say, can you check your records and tell me which product I ordered? Um, but Rudbeckia, um, Herta is used a lot, um, in those seed mixes so that people can have that initial punch of color coming in. Um, and they are usually mixed with other Rudbeckias, usually two or three others that will then get established and start coming into bloom in future years. Um, but the Rudbeckia herta being tending to be more of an annual um, will give you that initial punch of color. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Unless anybody has any last minute questions. Oh, we have, thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, that, that does it for us here. So thank you very much, Mary. And You're thank welcome. you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, after we're done, we will receive a survey and we would really, really appreciate it if you would complete it and provide your feedback. It helps us improve. Um, and you'll receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. And Mary, we are just getting all of these thank yous in in the questions. Oh, so, wonderful. Lots and, and lots of thank yous. <laughs> should mention so, that in, in two weeks, I'm probably gonna do my final webinar for the year. No! And we're gonna talk about <laughs> alliums. Well. Oh, alliums. Yes. And, and I'm I'm preparing to move out of the country, and so it's gotten a little oh. hectic. And so hopefully, once I get established in Jerusalem, then I will contact Laura, and we will look at doing these online. The difference is it's eight hours later there, so we would have to do these at the very latest, probably at 4 p.m. I was going to say, that's um, so one that heck can... of a time difference. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, um, so look forward to hearing from you maybe for the Alliums program. And at that time, we're going to talk about the very special um, bulb program uh, that's opening up to uh, MSHS members and other gardeners uh, where you can order through, through the Hort Society with um, 
I can't remember the name of the company, but I'm sure Laura will, will be here for the next webinar and can give you all the details because it's a win-win because then there will be a free program on bulbs coming from this company also available to, to uh, members and anyone that registers. I'm here, Mary. Okay, tell us more about it. Yes, it's called Bloomin' Bucks, and it is up and running right now. Oh, it's great. a fundraiser um, through Brent and Becky's Bulbs. So if you go onto our website at northerngardener.org, you will see on the homepage um, the big Bloomin' Bucks image, and you can click on that and order your bulbs, and we get a, I think it's a 50% um, payout from those orders. So it's a great fundraiser for the Hort Society. Thanks for mentioning that, Mary. Yeah, and, and isn't isn't Brent gonna give a talk then or something? He is, so anybody who purchases bulbs will receive a webinar uh, with Brent from Brent and Becky's Bulbs, and he is, he's, he's great, he's a great presenter. presenter. Yep. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. On behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society, thank you for joining us tonight. Stay safe. Thank you.